The autopsies of Willie Kemani and Josphat Mwenda show that they both died from injuries due to blunt force trauma to their heads and other body parts. But how were the suspects tied to the scene of the crime? So it's very interesting because uh, the two belong to the SPIF team in Mlolongo. And during investigations, when they were finding out where they were on 23rd June, everyone had a story to tell. Everyone was far away from duty, so there was no one on duty that day. To start with Leliman, uh, his phones were in a different place than where he was. So he intentionally separated himself from his personal phones so that in case someone tries to trace them, they'll place him in a different place. Same with Mwangi. Mwangi asked for leave. And he said he was traveling to see his family in Roiro. And so he was away from Lolongo area. And, uh, and that is what they, they came up with. Is it not true, uh, Chief Inspector, that in any unit in a police station, you cannot have two people who are in the same unit go on leave at the same time? It can be possible, but sometimes it can't. Mobile data records gathered by investigators show that neither Leliman nor Mwangi's phones were anywhere near the scene of the crimes on the night of the murders. But investigators also say that there is one piece of evidence that ties both Leliman and Mwangi to that scene on that same night. Leliman's police radio. The pocket phone radio that was allocated to Mlolongo Spiff team told us a different story. And this pocket phone radio was in the possession of uh, the first accused, Frederick Leliman. And if Frederick Leliman was off duty, it was Mwangi who had it. And the pocket phone just showed us their movement on June 23rd. And it was in line with the, the crime scenes that the police were investigating. At the scene of the murders, other clues led to even more compelling evidence. Police found spent energy drink cans, paper bags and plastic bottles as well as fecal matter, which were all taken for testing to check if any DNA traces matched either their suspects or the victims. They also found cigarette butts, all of which had one specific DNA profile. Investigating officers got phone records for a number of telephone numbers and cross-referenced them to see whether they were at any or all of the scenes. The Mavoko Law Courts, the killing field in Soweto along Mombasa Road or Oldonyo Sabuk River. One number was at all three scenes, at times that matched the timelines of the kidnappings, the murders and the dumpings. That number belonged to perhaps the most crucial figure in the case, Peter Ngoge. One more thing tied Ngoge to the scene. At the killing scene, we were able to place him using DNA because while he was at the killing scene, he was smoking a lot of cigarettes. And we, out of the cigarettes that were collected, about five matched his DNA. On August the 8th, 2016, Ngoge was arrested and later charged. But who is Peter Ngoge? Ngoge, known more by his alias, Brown, was a police informant for Leliman's boss, the OCS of the Mlolongo police station, Stephen Lalay. And so he said that uh, he was introduced to the SPIF team by the then OCS of Nolongo, that was uh, Chief Inspector Stephen Lilly. They used to work together when he was the OCS in Kabete when they were trying to get rid of Mungiki. So they became very good friends. And so when he moved to Nolongo from uh, his former place, he called him and told him to come, let's meet and let's uh, talk. So what happened here? 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 And that is how he was introduced into the plan. And so Leliman explained to him, I have this person who's disturbing me, and I think it is time we get rid of him, and I need your help. So the role you're going to play is you're going to conduct surveillance. He's coming to court on 23rd June. I want you to follow him, tell me about his movements, and when he leaves court, inform me. And that is what exactly, that is what he did. Mm -hmm. I recall when we got to court, we noticed a lot of uh, surveillance on our team. 
um, we noticed people who were very curious to see what we were doing and they were following us around because initially we went to the first court where the case was to be mentioned but the case was not mentioned at all, it's being mentioned in another court. So we moved to another court, the container court, which was a few meters away. So you could be able to see if someone was really interested in your movements. And I remember I spotted about two or three people. And I told Willie that we were being surveilled and he acknowledged he had also noted the same thing. One of those people was Brown. The series of events that followed as per his first confession break down what happened next. After identifying Willie and Josphat, Brown says he got into Leliman's car, where he claims he also found Sergeant Leonard Mwangi. They followed Willie's vehicle until they got to these railway tracks close to the Mavoko Law Courts, jumped out and arrested Willie, Joseph and Josphat. Now when they were bundled into another car, he was informed to drive this car. He was to take it to Meru initially, but uh, the petrol was not sufficient. So he decided to take it to an area which he knew very well, uh, Limuru. He dumped the car and then he went back to Mlolongo to join them. Uh, at seven, when they went to pick up the three, he was a driver. While meeting over drinks at 7 p.m. that same day, Brown claimed that Leliman received a call indicating that Willie was somehow able to make a call and share that they had been arrested. Leliman would place a call to an officer only known as Kamenju, asking him to make his way to the Siokimao police post. This is what happened when they all met back at the Siokimao police post. They would then drive to the killing field. Brown lit cigarette after cigarette and watched from Leliman's car while Josphat, then Willie, then Joseph were taken out of the boot of Leliman's vehicle, nylon paper bags placed over their heads and strangled to death. <laughs> The bodies would be placed in Leliman's and Kamenju's cars and the four set out to Oldonyo Sabok River. All of this was part of Brown's statement. Case closed, right? Investigating officers had recorded a video of Brown leading them to every place he had identified in his confession. That was supposed to have been the piece of evidence that strengthened testimony about Leliman's and Mwangi's presence at the crime scene and their complicity in the murders. Tell me about the video uh, and the written confession. The video and the written confession, they are supposed to have led to the unraveling of this case. But if you look even at the investigating officers, all these scenes that Brown is supposed to have led them in now in this video, as since they had already gone to, and they had even marked, if you look at the video, these scenes have crime scene tape, everything. He did not lead them to any scene that they did not know. So that's why that video and confession 
as I have always, as Brown also indicates to the court, the investigating officers, they molded his confession, whatever he told them, to fit a narrative they already had, which was that these four people they had already arrested caused the death of these three people. Brown not only changed his confession, he included other officers from the SPIV team that Leliman and Mwangi served with to, at least in the defense's eyes, this effect. None. None of the accused persons were at that scene. Including Leliman. Including Leliman. Investigating officers were very confident in their evidence until this happened. Defense lawyers representing each of the accused seized on Brown's recanted confession to discredit his evidence and focused on areas that investigating officers should have sewn up properly, like the assertion that only Lenny Mann could have had his police radio on him. No, I had no idea what I told us here. At no time on the 23rd of June 2016, did you even try to reach it? No. No. If you are saying that he was not at the scene and the radio was there, that yeah. means he never had the radio. Mm -hmm. Somebody else must have had the radio. This is benefit of doubt. So when the court comes and says he must have been in all these places, bring evidence. The witnesses came yeah. from the scene who said they did not see him. People who actually saw the people at the, the murder scene. Mm -hmm to phone records and a testing of suspects' alibis. DCI is the one who extracted the data mobile mo movement and must have studied it to show actually the movement of the suspect. Surprisingly, no effort was made even to go to that home and confirm whether he was there. There was no visit by NDCI officer. To which one? One is who? They ought to have confirmed this is the movement. To the fact that there was one officer who, by Brown's account, was present at the crime scene, Kamenju. This is the only name that Brown says he knew him by. In his second statement, he says it was Kamenju who was central to the murders, not Leliman. Police had crucial leads that may have helped track Kamenju down, from a phone number that Brown allegedly communicated with Kamenju on, to eyewitness accounts. Investigators left all these loose ends on the table. There were claims that Kamenju would come to court during the trial, and that he is well known to many in the police service. Yet nothing has been done to find him. But then, there was also this. Police informer Peter Ngugi has told the murder trial of lawyer Kimani that an attempt was made to buy his silence. Both the prosecution and the defense gave their evidence over the five-year trial. 47 witnesses, over 2,000 written documents, and thousands of hours of testimony, all leading to one verdict. But what it has cost the victims since the trial began is uncountable. Coming face to face uh, with the killers really was not easy. Because usually even you attempted even to want to ask them questions. Why did you do this? Wasn't there anything else you could have done? Could you have set them free? Nilikuja kusikia hata mwenye alikuwa ameniajiri yeye mwenyewe ako amo, e, ni mocho ya wao. Sasa nilikuwa natamani sana hata nifike hiyo koti nione kama huyo ni yule siri vya najua au naweza kuwa ni majina zinafanana. Sasa mimi vile nilienda huko wenye nilikuwa natambua ni Sylvia na Leremani. Odho Leremani kuna mwingine akwanga huko tu sivi ni kama wanafanana. Mimi nimesema nimewasamehe kwa, kwa pande yangu. Yaani hiyo ndio hiyo uchungu yeishe. That pain. The world is that much poorer without Willie, Josphat, and Joseph. For them to have fought for justice and died because of their fight is an unfair trade-off. 
but a much larger story is going to be told because of deaths like theirs. And it won't only be about sorrow. Sasa unaona kama hapa kando yangu kuna nikiangalia hapa naona nga Victor ukiangalia hii meeting ingine next huyo ni kijana anaitwa anaitwa Marcus ukiangalia pale una kijana aliyoulio anaitwa Jemu unaona there are now over 40 convictions of police officers who have abused their power leading to deaths and hundreds of cases actively being investigated by IPOA and while resolving the question of accountability of senior officers for the crimes of their juniors hasn't occurred, with everything that is coming out of the trial, there are steps in the right direction towards full police accountability. The stand of my defense has shaken the veracity of the evidence of the prosecution against him, being that of the fifth at least alone. And therefore, I gave him the benefit of the doubt and acquit him of all the three counts of murder under Section 352 of the Criminal Procedure Code. Uh, for the first, second, third, and fifth, that is unsatisfied, the prosecution has proved the case against them beyond a reasonable doubt. And therefore, I found this uh, the guilty of the three counts of murder under Section 203 of the Penal Code. And we do hope and pray that. Finally, when the sentence is pronounced, it will be commensurate to the, uh, the kind of crime that was committed, murder of three innocent Kenyans. And that, that is why today we say justice now. We say justice now for all victims of police killings and extrajudicial executions. Where Willie, Joseph and Josephat fell, a seed was planted. Willie's colleagues are even more committed to what they do. Their families have refused to let their memories die. And Kenyans, though they have gone through even more dark days, may now understand the challenge ahead of them. What is justice? What does it look like? Years of a trial? Or a fight today? for a system that is a shield to everyone.